Today on Retire With Purpose, fractured families and how to mend them, how much cash you should hold in retirement and where, and making better Social Security and pension decisions. Welcome to Retire With Purpose, a show specifically designed to help you maximize your financial confidence in retirement. Casey Weed is the CEO and Chief Visionary of Howard Bailey Financial, a certified financial planner and Wall Street Journal bestselling author. He's your host on Retire With Purpose. It's great to see you again. Thanks for joining us. My name is Lee Kelso, and of course, I'm here with Casey Weed, certified financial planner. He's the founder and president of Howard Bailey Financial, Wall Street Journal bestselling author and host of the Retire With Purpose podcast. And he recently talked with someone who I'm sure appealed to him because, well, I know you're just a huge family guy, right? Three <laughs> small kids. And I'm sure that's why you wanted to talk with Dr. Carl Pillimer. Uh, that's one of the many reasons that I wanted to have a conversation with Dr. Pillimer because family is not just important to our family, but it's important to the families we work with right. day in and day out. And what we often find is that the families we work with, they've estranged uh, their children in some way. There's some estrangement going on. And it's largely quite often affected by some financial issues that came up throughout their lifetime. And Dr. Carl Pillimer, he is a professor of human development. He's a professor of gerontology at Cornell, but he also wrote a really great book called Fault Lines, uh, Fractured Families and How to Mend Them. And in just a moment, if you stick around, we're going to share with you how to get your own copy for free of Dr. Carl, Carl Pillimer's book. He shares with us that family estrangement is a silent epidemic that is affecting 65 million Americans. This isn't something that just affects a few families. Maybe you just feel that you're alone in this. No, there's many families that are enduring some type of estrangement. And I had to ask him, you know, because this has kind of evolved and we're seeing more and more of this today, is family still important today as it was to maybe your parents and past generations? Everybody thinks or talks about our society as sort of anything goes, traditional family bonds are breaking down, family is friends. I began to ask myself, why is family still so important? Why do people continue to care about these relationships you know, as much as they do? So I interviewed hundreds of people, including some people who at the start of an interview would say, this is fine, you know, I don't see my parents anymore, uh, you know, I feel good. I have other friends. And by the end of the interview, they would confess that it did, that, that something felt like it was missing. So, so that is an interest, you know, why, when you could let these bonds go, do they persist? Part of it is social pressure, for sure, that there's kind of a stigma against abandoning your family. But Casey, there's something else uh, that we forget, especially with siblings and parents. You know, there are biologically rooted processes going on here of attachment that has, have been documented by psychologists for 60 or 70 years. Uh, and, and we don't just get over them when we lose someone. So we experience that as a sense of loss, even if our head tells us it's fine. This was a really meaningful discussion for myself and our family and so many other families that sent emails and, and gave us feedback to let us know the impact this made. And one of those areas that I think was one of the biggest takeaways for a lot of the individuals that were following this particular interview was something that Dr. Pillomer called an intergenerational stake, the importance of recognizing who the relationship is most important to. Yes, adult children love their parents. Yes, they often heroically support them. But in every study, parents care more. Parents are more invested in the relationship than their adult children are. And that's because you've invested all this um, emotion, resources in them. So that it's called, uh, it's called the intergenerational stake. Older parents have an intergenerational stake in their kids that's greater than their kids and their parents. And I say this in the book, so that when a parent that decides, as I found in my studies, and I bet that, that, that you may find around finances, a parent draws the line in the sand around, say, um, um, a gender or sexual orientation or value differences or violating the family's code or religious differences and says, you know, 
um, this is it to a child, it's much easier for that child to say, fine. Uh, you know, I'm going to develop other options. I'm going to do other things. So the relationship is easier to exit for children. And especially for parents who are as old as me, I'm 66 or above, who grew up with this sense that family trumps everything else, that you can behave any way you want to in a family, and people may be mad at you, but they won't leave. I counsel, you know, parents of adult children to understand that that is not true. They won't always be there. So you must develop relationships with your children that also have aspects of friendship that, that don't involve judgment and anger and hostility. You know, I really enjoyed Fault Lines. That was a focus of our discussion. But Dr. Pilmer has written a couple other books, 30 Lessons for Living, 30 Lessons for Loving. And in the time leading up to those books, it was really the culmination of literally thousands of interviews that were conducted with America's elders by himself and his team. And time and time again, there was one regret that continued to come up in all of these conversations. For parents of young children, Casey, they had a one strong recommendation that came up again and again and again, um, and that was the importance of time, of spending time with children, of carving out time, and having in a busy family life, and it's difficult, as much unstructured time as you can give to them. One of the biggest regrets, especially of older men in that generation, was not spending enough time with their children, and even small units of quality time doesn't make up for this sense of really being there. Look, a, two, a working dual career, um, a low income couple is gonna struggle with this. But throughout the many relationships, this spending time with children is more important than sort of anything else. I know it sounds like a cliche again, but it was one of the major regrets of the old and it's one of the ones I have to say, even before I did this, I kind of knew to do it. But, but it's true even after they become adults and with grandchildren. Th this notion of time is the most precious resource and thinking carefully how you allocate it is one of the strongest uh, pieces of advice uh, that older people would give. And it certainly applies to kids. You know, one of the greatest benefits that I have had over the years is sitting in front of individuals that have a heck of a lot more experience in marriage and family than I do. And Dr. Pillimer is one of those individuals, not just his own personal experience and his education, but the thousands of individuals that he has met with on this subject over the years. So I had to ask him, what is your number one piece of advice for the younger generation? What you should do uh, you know, uh, if, if they would say, if, if there's one piece of advice I wouldn't give to younger people, or one thing I want you to put in that book, it's that life is short, or life is really short, or life is really, really short, or as an older engineer said, it passes in a nanosecond. And the older you get, the more and more people would say at 90 or 100, they were the most likely to say, I can't believe how fast this went. One 99-year-old actually said, it's one of my favorite quotes, I don't know how this happened because the next thing you know, you're 100. Um, and that's the feeling of the next thing you know, you're 100. So they argue that for all of these domains, with your family life, child life, is to live life like it's really short. Um, and their view of younger people's ideas about time is the way like a desert tribeman, tribesman might view our profligate use of water that it's this unbelievably scarce resource that we absolutely waste. And that's, I think, this taking the long view as a parent. How's what you do now gonna lead you know, to beneficial relationships later? As a worker, how is the savings I'm gonna do now gonna lead to productive 30 or 40 years? And as a new retiree, how am I gonna use this incredibly precious resource? Because I have a much more limited time horizon. Yeah, there's a lot to think about there, isn't there? Yeah, yeah there's sure there's a is. lot there. That's episode number 219. You can just go to retirewithpurpose.com and find Dr. Carl Pillimer there, or we hope you're going to be uh, one of the next folks to jump on the phone and request a copy of Dr. Pillimer's book. It's called Fault Lines. Uh, it's all about fractured families and how to mend them. So here's an opportunity for you to receive this book at no cost just by calling 866-482-9559 or even easier 
just pick up your phone and text FAULT to 866-482-9559. And Casey and the team at Howard Bailey will send you a copy of Fault Lines, Dr. Pillimer's book, with no cost and no obligation. Hope you'll take them up on that offer. We are right back in just a second. Marshall Johnson joins Casey, and one of the things we're going to talk about is how much cash you should have sticking around. Stay with us. Here's a retirement reality check. There are new threats to your lifelong savings in the form of taxes. Have you taken the steps to prepare? The Howard Bailey team wants to help educate you on how to safeguard your retirement from the ticking tax time bomb. Learn how to leverage this low tax rate environment before rates increase by registering for our complimentary tax time bomb webinar hosted by National IRA Distribution Educator Ed Slot. Web times are limited, so register now by calling or texting the word BOMB04 to 866-482-9559. Call or text the word BOMB04 to 866-482-9559. Investment advisory services offered through Howard Bailey Securities, LLC, a registered investment advisor. Howard Bailey Financial does not offer legal or tax advice. Please consult the appropriate professional regarding your individual circumstances. Welcome back, and we are now joined by one of my closest friends and also the co-host of the Retire With Purpose podcast, Marshall Johnson here with us. Hey, glad to be here. And Marshall is joining the show just as he does join the podcast every single Friday where we discuss one of the four articles that we send out as part of our Weekend Reading for Retirees email series. That's one email that goes out to you every single Friday with four articles on trending topics in the retirement planning space, all designed to help you make better decisions about your retirement and your finances. Now today, we're going to be spotlighting an article with you from episode 200 of the Retire With Purpose podcast. This one comes to us from Seeking Alpha, titled, How Much Cash Should You Hold? Marshall, why did we choose this particular article? Yeah, I like this article because it addresses something that we hear in our office week in, week out. Families wanting to know how much cash should we keep on hand for emergencies, opportunities, and it's something that I, it needs to be addressed in the environment that we're in today. Well, we're going into now what is the second decade of the so-called war on savers. And what is that? Well, that is a war on savers, war on retirees. It is this war on interest rates. We've had ultra low interest rates for an extended period of time. And that leaves individuals like you going, boy, what do I do with my cash to still make sure that I'm keeping up with inflation? So low interest rates and how much cash you, can, you should hold, this is real issue today. This article discusses what cash is, how to best define cash, and I think most importantly for you right now is discussing those alternatives for retaining that cash. But first we have to determine exactly what cash is. Yeah, what cash is. You know, sometimes people get a little confused and say, well, I'll just liquidate my stocks if I have an emergency, right? Well, that's something that's marketable. Cash is liquid, meaning we can safely get our hands on it within a very short period of time. Yeah, this is a core piece of our retirement planning process. The first step is determining how much liquidity you need and exactly where we're going to keep that cash. That cash could be cash on hand, it could be money in the bank, maybe a savings account, a checking account. You know, it's those safe places you can access cash in a moment's notice. What do I mean by a moment's notice? Well, in this article, they give a pretty good, however, kind of a, a dire example, but they share with us an example of, hey, what if your children were kidnapped and the ransom was demanded within 24, 48 hours? How quickly would you be able to access cash? Where would you go for that cash? I think that's a pretty vivid example that shares with you exactly, well, maybe I don't have the liquidity or the cash available that I thought I did. Yeah, you start to talk about thresholds, right? If we listen to Dave Ramsey, he's going to say, hey, you should have three to six months if you're both working or six to 12 months, different rules of thumb. But again, we got to be careful using those rules of thumb. Yeah, I think there's two different rules of thumb that the families we work with are following. And I, I think they evolve over time. In your early years, that rule of thumb for how much cash you should have on hand is that Dave Ramsey guideline, say three to six months of cash reserves on hand to cover those expenses in case an emergency arises. And I will say, that that three to six months, again, that's a rule of thumb. It doesn't apply to everyone. And throughout your lifetime, that changes, you know, where it becomes not just about having emergency cash on hand, but just simply about sleeping well at night. Yeah. And that's what we find is one of the biggest impacts of having cash balances. Research shows 
that it's not the largest brokerage accounts that create the greatest peace of mind, but it's the greatest amount of liquidity or cash that you have on hand that you could access in a moment's notice. Yeah, you talk about this low interest rate environment that we're in today. We have to kind of start to look out for alternatives because, Casey, a lot of the families we work with still want to have a significant liquid bucket. Yeah, and I think some of these cash sources that are discussed in this article, there's short-term cash reserves, and then there's more opportunistic cash reserves. When you're young and you're starting to save, it's really about just having an emergency plan, but then eventually it really becomes part of your wealth strategy, having some dry powder on hand that maybe takes a little bit longer to access. Maybe it takes a week or two weeks to access that excess liquidity for opportunities that may arise. And the article walks us through three of those kind of core areas that they regard as cash resources or alternative liquidity options. The first one being having home equity. The second one being having a loan secured through your brokerage account. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's an, inter that's an interesting take on it. But yeah, home equity is one of those places where I think a lot of folks say, well, if I have an emergency, I can always tap into my home equity. And yes, those things have gotten easier, but they have their challenges yeah. as well. Well, and I think one of the areas that I find many of the families that we'll work with for the first time overlook mm -hmm. is they're overlooking old life insurance policies that have been sitting around yeah. forever that have significant cash value. And there's multiple ways you can access that cash value. You could mm -hmm. be accessing that cash in the way of taking a loan from the policy right. or a withdrawal from the policy. I've even had families that I've worked with use them as collateral to secure additional loans. So the article goes on to share some other alternatives. And what I love about this article is we're not gonna agree with everything. Um, and it's good, it's okay to disagree. And, yeah. and they talk about some other uh, hybrids, if you will. Well, these are definitely some of the areas that we're going to disagree with yeah. over at Howard Bailey. And I think it's important to recognize always, whenever you're reading an article, take a look at the source. Who is the author and what is their intention behind writing this article? Well, this article had some good benefits and good reading material, I think if you dig in further, you're going to find that this was an article that was written to sell mainly a dividend newsletter. So some of these hybrid cash alternatives that are discussed are somewhat pointed to get you to sign up for that newsletter. The first one being baby bonds. Baby bonds are very ultra short-term bonds that are relatively new to the financial industry. Short-term bonds typically issued by smaller companies. They're very, very thinly traded, so they're not quite as liquid as you might find a Fortune 500 stock or a large cap stock for that reason, or even a corporate bond issued by a company such as Apple. And so they're thinly traded and FINRA, the regulatory authority overseeing this market has said that this is a major regulatory risk that they're looking at addressing in the near future. If you're not comfortable investing in a high yield bond fund or a junk bond fund, you're probably not going to be comfortable with the risk of a baby bond. So the baby, uh, you know, babies sometimes look real cute and when your friends start having them, you go, well, I'd like to get the baby itch. Uh, but this is one you may just want to stay away from. Yeah, right? you don't want that baby screaming at three o'clock in the morning. And that's one of the things you want to watch out for. Then the article goes into preferred stocks and dividend stocks, making two specific recommendations. One of these recommendations in the preferred stock world, the author says, hey, it yields 9% per year. The other one in the dividend stock world yielded about 7% per year, right. saying that that dividend is going to cushion any price decreases so that these positions positions are relatively stable, but go also going on to say that stable prices are going to be a requirement for this to be a good cash alternative. And why do, why do we need emergency money sometimes? Why right? do we need when money things for are, opportunities? Yeah, when, when crisis happens, right? When the yeah. market drops like 07 to 09, um, those, those two examples lost 30%, lost 80%. That's, that's not a stable price environment to access that capital. Yeah, usually when opportunities arise or emergencies come along, that means that things probably aren't going all that well in the equity markets. These are not solutions for cash that we would recommend. The thing is that you need to know all of your options. That's the moral of the story. Know all of your options. Know what's available for that excess cash that you're gonna keep on the sidelines. Know that it's okay to have that excess cash on the sidelines and hey, Cash is still king today. If you'd like to sit down with a financial planner from our team where we can walk you through all those cash alternatives that maybe you're not hearing from your stockbroker, then pick up the phone, give us a call right now, or text consult to the number on your screen. Stick around because up next, we're gonna be discussing pension 
options as well as social security planning. Here's a retirement reality check. There are new threats to your lifelong savings in the form of taxes. Have you taken the steps to prepare? The Howard Bailey team wants to help educate you on how to safeguard your retirement from the ticking tax time bomb. Learn how to leverage this low tax rate environment before rates increase by registering for our complimentary tax time bomb webinar hosted by National IRA Distribution Educator Ed Slot. Web times are limited, so register now by calling or texting the word BOMB04 to 866-482-9559. Call or text the word BOMB04 to 866-482-9559. Investment advisory services offered through Howard Bailey Securities, LLC, a registered investment advisor. Howard Bailey Financial does not offer legal or tax advice. Please consult the appropriate professional regarding your individual circumstances. It is really easy to get a question to Casey and the Howard Bailey team. All you have to do is email your question to info at howardbailey.com, and we might use it here on the program. For example, here's a question from one of our viewers. I need to decide whether to take a full pension or a lesser amount with survivor benefits. What's the best way to understand the pros and cons of these options? Well, there's a lot of families that have been going through these pension decisions as this is really probably one of the last generations of retirees that are going to be lucky enough to be retiring with the guaranteed income that their employer is going to be providing. And this isn't a decision that you should make lightly any more than you should make the decision around when you should be filing for your Social Security benefits. I mean, think about how big of a decision this is. Let's take, for instance, that you have a pension that's going to pay $20,000 every single year for the rest of your life. You know, that's equivalent to having about $400,000 saved for retirement. This is a really big decision. You're talking about a decision that's going to create hundreds of thousands of dollars of income for the rest of your life. You don't just run out and buy a half a million dollar home without doing some research. You should be doing that with your social security. You shouldn't be doing that with your pension either. You know, many families have not just joint pension options and single pension options and everything in between, but you might also also have a lump sum pension option as well. And all of these things need to be analyzed. Look at the facts and figures. You know, I had a couple that I worked with a number of years ago that they came in and they had two different pensions. They had a lump sum pension on one company's pension payout, another one had a lump sum pension, and then of course they had everything in between. They had single life all the way to joint and survivor benefits. And we looked at the hard numbers. And at the end of the meeting, we decided that they were going to take the joint and survivor payout on the, the largest of those pensions. And we were going to take the lump sum on the smaller of those two pensions. And they said, Casey, we've actually been shopping around. We've seen three different advisors with the same question. And we've decided to go with you because you're the only one that actually showed us the facts and figures. And that's all typically around one thing. That's internal rate of return. What's your break even? Same way you look at the social security decision, if I delay this benefit or if I take a joint survivor versus a single life or a lump sum pension option, when's my pen, when, when is my break even point when I start to get a return? If you have a half million dollar pension or an income you're going to get monthly, yeah, if you take the half million dollar lump sum versus taking the payout, how long if you took the payout would it take to get a half a million dollars? That's really the thing that you're trying to determine to see what type of rate of return you would need on that lump sum to find a break even. And we can continue to take this further and further. I had a couple that was a local engineer and they had just a joint survivor option or a single life option. We ended up taking the single life option and using the difference between the joint survivor and the single life to buy life insurance policies that would ensure that not only did they get that income for the rest of their life, just like they would have if they took the joint survivor, but they also would receive a death benefit for their heirs if they both were to pass away. And that's one of the biggest concerns for pensioners out there. You receive this pension, you start getting a payment, but if you die tomorrow, all that hard work, that 30, 40 year career that you had, well, all that money's gone. There are things you can do to protect against it. So you make the decision, bottom line, by running the numbers with someone that understands how best to run those numbers and explain them to you in a simple to understand format. Man, that is such good advice. Okay, I'm in my early 50s and in what you might call the constrained category of retirement readiness. I still wanna make savings and planning for retirement a priority, but how can I balance that with also taking time to enjoy life now? Isn't that a dilemma that almost all of us really face? And I've got a friend of mine years ago that said, I'm not saving anything for retirement. I wanna enjoy my life today. 
And this person had never run a budget before, right? It really comes down to budgeting. You have the ability to truly enjoy life today. And especially remember, it's not about things. It's about experiences that can really help when you're looking at your budget, making sure you're allocating those dollars away from things and towards experiences. But I would encourage you to go back and listen to one of the Retire With Purpose podcasts, episode number 190-190. We highlighted a Tim Ferriss blog post titled Single Ply, A Fool's Bargain, right? You ever buy a single ply? Well, you end up spending just about as much on toilet paper at the end of the day because you have to use so much more. It's a fool's bargain. Look at the way that you are spending your dollars. Take a look at those expenses, those areas that you've been putting dollars where it's led to a good savings opportunity. You saved some money and it was worth it. It added value. And those other areas where maybe you were trying to pinch your pennies and it really didn't add value to your life. But I think the inverse of this is just as valuable, is looking at those areas where you've invested dollars, you've had expenses that have actually led to an outsized return versus those things that you bought over the last 12 months, you purchased over the last 12 months, that really weren't worth it, that maybe you've totally forgot about. Maybe you're able to trim some of those areas in your life that haven't added a whole lot of value and put more into those areas where it's added tremendous value. And you can put more into those areas where you've saved and maybe you can save a little bit more so you can put them towards those experiences that really positively impact your life. I have calculated that my wife will collect a larger Social Security benefit if it's based on my earnings instead of her own. When should she file? That's a great question. However, unfortunately, the rules have been changed when it comes to Social Security guideline rules. You know, now you don't have the ability to choose between those two. There's something called the deemed filing rule. The deemed filing rule means when she files, she is deemed to have filed for the highest benefit that she's that's available to her, whether that's your benefit or filing on her own record. Now, the only caveat to that is either divorce or in the case of widowship, and you probably don't want to have to go down the road of becoming a widow or her becoming a widow in order to be able to choose which benefit that she's going to apply for and using some of those more advanced file and suspend rules. But there are some families that oddly enough, choose to get divorced these days so they have more flexibility around their Social Security filing decision. It's been said that Social Security is subsidizing divorce today. Hmm, that's pretty interesting. <laughs> I had no idea that there was that much of a change in the flexibility or lack of flexibility in how you manage Social Security. Yeah, there were a lot of Social Security events that you probably were invited to years ago, and many of those Social Security events they've completely went away because there's just not quite as much to discuss when it comes to some of those rules, but there are still options. There's still a lot to think about as it integrates with the rest of your financial plan. So that's a good reason for you to take the time and sit down with somebody who really knows what's going on. And I'm telling you, that's a member of the Howard Bailey team. They're independent advisors and they're ready to meet with you and help you get through just exactly what kind of pitfalls you're going to face in retirement. How should you file for that pension? What should you do about Social Security? Do you have appropriate coverage for life insurance and health insurance? And oh my gosh, the list just goes on and on. So please take the time to be one of the next 10 people to call 866-482-9559 or text consult to 866-482-9559 and schedule your meeting with a member of the Howard Bailey team. We are back next week. We'll see you then.